Of AOC she has principles. Still. Oh, does she? She has principles. She didn't cry over spilled milk. Well, she, just protecting Israelis. Yeah, she so cries over she's, that. She's, she's, it's been beautiful what she's cried over recently. I'm By just, the way, hang on just a second. Mm-hmm. May I just side yeah. note, Your Honor, approach the bench. Um, Texas is uh, taking um, a lot of its uh, money out of mutual funds that have Ben and Jerry's in it. <laughs> really? Yeah, Texas, great state of Texas. Mm. Thank goodness. Thank you for that. Always, always <clears throat> interesting. This back and forth. I, I think the. Uh, I'm just like, uh, I'm so sick of this fake drama they're trying to create of, over whether AOC is going to stop all the spending bills because of her principles. Come <laughs> on, do we really believe? That AOC, because she wants $3.5 trillion in spending and is only going to get, what, 2.7 or something, and it's all going to be done with accounting tricks anyway, she's going to stop the additional $1.2 trillion. I'm not going to give you that bipartisan $1.2 trillion because I want my $3.5 trillion. She wants all of it. If she only gets... Three point seven trillion instead of four point five trillion. Do we really believe that she's going to stop this? I'm not forgiving them any trillion. The proper number is zero, zero. trillion. Zero. zero trillion, zero million, zero thousand. All these bills, they have all kinds of little surprises tucked inside of them. Yeah. All of them. And that's that's in addition to the part that all of the spending is obviously problematic, but it's also creating programs that will last forever. So forever. we say $3.5 trillion, that's over the next 10 years. It just goes on in perpetuity. So there's no, there's no ending to that spending. It just goes on and on. Do you really think after three or four years of universal pre-K that the Republicans are going to stand up and repeal it? Give me a break. There's zero chance that happens. Zero. The Republicans are truly worthless at this point. They really are. Yeah, once these things get in, they never they stand never, up to do anything. Never. They as don't stand seen. up as they're being put in, let alone after. This. Uh, we have Mike Pompeo on in just a minute. I'm really excited to talk to him. He's he's one of my favorites in the administration. Uh, let me tell you about our sponsor, the Cup. Redistricting is happening now, and of course the Democrats are doing everything they can to redistrict in their favor. The Republicans also have a redistricting trust uh, as the battles heat up for 2022. Luckily, one of the guys who's the co-chairman, I trust, (laughs) and a, a good guy. Secretary Mike Pompeo is that man. He joins us in 60 seconds. CIA director, uh, former U.S. Secretary of State, and chairman of CAVPAC, and also the co-chair of the National Republican Redistricting Trust, Mike Pompeo is with us. Mike, you really need to get a resume. Uh, (laughs) Good morning, Glenn. Great to be with you. Good to be with you, sir. Um, Thank you for coming on. I want to talk to you about redistricting, but I have to ask you a question on a story that broke yesterday. Uh, from Michael Isakoff, so take it for what it's worth, that says that the gist of the article, you were so obsessed with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks that you and the president were, were looking at really aggressive methods, including kidnapping or an assassination. One scenario included a possible shootout with Russian agents who you believed were going to try to get Assange for themselves. Uh, Glenn, I've seen the piece. I knew they were writing on this thing. Uh, I'd say three things. First of all, it's it's a cop we, we've seen. Uh, he was a big Russia hoax perpetrator. Yep, he was. Yeah. So so, so take take that for what it's worth. Second, uh, there are many stories out there now about how the president and I were engaged in things that were crazy. Right? There's this talk about that there was an effort to drop a nuclear weapon on China in the last week's administration. This story is of that same ilk, right? Just I I couldn't tell you who they have as their sources, but those sources didn't know what we were doing. And then the third point, I guess, Glenn, is we were we were very worried about the fact that we had bad actors who who were stealing really, really sensitive material from the United States. And I, I I make no apologies for the fact that we and the administration were working diligently to make sure that we were able to protect this important sensitive information from whether it was cyber actors in Russia or the Chinese military or anyone who was trying to take this information away from us, not just commercial stuff like intellectual property theft, but real national security secrets. And so we were working hard 
to go after those bad actors who were trying to do that. So was Assange and WikiLeaks, are they, uh, are they journalists in a media outlet or a, or a hostile intelligence entity? So I came to believe that they were, in fact, the, one of the first non-state hostile intelligence entities. They weren't mm. engaged in even crappy reporting like Isakov does. They were, they were engaged in <laughs> active, active efforts to uh, steal secrets themselves and pay others to do the same in a way that violated uh, both the central understandings that I think the American people get and second, violated U.S. law as well. We, we were always careful. Um, I'm all about a big, bold, strong First Amendment, but these folks were acting in ways that were deeply inconsistent with that. Okay, they're redistricting now, um, and these last for 10 years. Uh, as they draw the district lines in 2021 and 2022, they'll be in place for 10 years, and that's how we elect uh, officials, uh, and it's embarrassing the way they snake uh, through... Uh, uh, districts, quite honestly, um, you you are coordinating the national redistricting strategy for the Republicans. Tell me what you're doing and why it's so important. So, Glenn, the last time we did this, now coming on ten years ago, the Republican Party went uh, full hibernation mode. We we just we played victim. We screamed at the Democrats for behaving badly, and then suffered the consequences of this, where they drew maps that just couldn't get conservatives and Republicans to win. Sure. So my, my, my view is enough. I want to crush them. I want to make sure we get fair maps every place we go. We, look, we've seen what happens when Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer in charge with uh, Democrat president of the White House these last eight months. We have to make sure these maps are right and fair. And I want, I want state elected officials who, in the end, get to make these decisions, Republican state elected officials, to say, no, we're going to be serious about this. This is a decade-long decision we're making. And if the Democrats threaten to sue, bring it on. We're, we're going to make sure we have fair maps, and we're, we're going to provide the resources and intellectual firepower to help those state elected officials litigate against these Democrats. It's, it's a program on the other side run by Barack Obama and Eric Holder. Enough said. They're really the one running the show, aren't they? Isn't Barack Obama and his people really running everything now? On uh, this redistricting effort, it's very clear. President Obama has gone out and fought for maps that if you showed them to the average American, regardless of their party, they'd say that's crazy. They're deeply unfair. By the way, they don't reflect what, Glenn, you and I know, right? One, one person, one vote, right? They're just, they're just fundamentally indecent. And so what, what we can't do is complain and whine and do nothing. We have, to, we have to articulate our vision and then go out and fight and crush and never give an inch and fight these battles and win them and get fair maps for so that we can get conservatives elected. You know, I don't know if you know this, but uh, uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, towards the end of their lives, uh, they were corresponding with one another, and um, they said, you know, this is going to fail, and they said, yes, the other one, yes, but the people will see what we were trying to do, and the other one said, we should have put more Leviticus in it, and apparently what they were talking, <laughs> what they were talking about was... The idea of stakes that w districts should just be blocks of, you know, 500 or 1,000 people, and they should just be blocks. And those blocks just keep breaking up uh, as the population gets more and more dense. That would stop all yeah. of this, wouldn't it? It, it would. I'm, I'm familiar with that debate. Uh, they went at it. Uh, hammer and tong for sure. But yeah. You got a Senate that was represented by states, and then the you know, the deal to allow equal representation for the population in the House of Representatives. There were big fights about this. Here's what we know today. Today, not only Democrats and progressives, but even the courts have permitted these districts to be drawn in ways that are partisan and that reflect the, the worst of factions that those very founders were trying to right. bust up. We, we, we shouldn't do that. We should go back to a more traditional set of understandings. Uh, they, they create The Democrats create these commissions that have this veneer of nonpartisanship. They'll put five Democrats and two Republicans on the commission. We get rolled. We just can't let that happen. Uh, we cannot let them draw districts, not just, by the way, not just at the federal level, but county commission districts, state legislative districts. These things all matter for a decade. I'm convinced, Glenn, that with fair maps, the conservative voices will be heard and we'll have good things happen so all across America. This is why we have people like Nancy Pelosi in, because the districts are so crazy that they don't represent the 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 truth they represent uh a line really that snakes around to try to capture the people they want to capture and so 
the districts become more and more extreme, even if that district is not extreme. Do I have that That's right? Absolutely. You absolutely have it right. Take a look at what's going on in California, where they control the state legislature and the governorship. They're going to draw out a couple of members of Congress, or at least they're contemplating it, who won in close races last year. They'll make it nearly impossible for them to continue to serve and, frankly, to reflect the values of the people that they've been tasked to represent. They'll make these liberal districts. They'll make them 55-45 uh, Democrat and uh, they will try, as they might, to hang on to this little bit of power because in the end, Glenn, it's all about power for the progressives, and we have to make sure that these fair maps pre- prevent that from happening for another decade. Is How much does the uh, census play a role in this? Uh, it's a big deal. It obviously drives the data set that gets used in litigation and for state legislators to make their decisions. So, you know, the fact that there were questionable outcomes from this past census uh, you, certainly concerns me. Can you go into that? Because I don't think most people paid attention. That happened when everybody was talking about the election. <laughs> well, there are two things. One, there was a big court case. Uh, Secretary Ross had filed a court case. There's a, a lot of argument that says that the Constitution only intended citizens to be counted as part of the census. We were unsuccessful at that. So now you have census decisions. That is, how many members of Congress one state gets decided on how many people are there, even if they're here illegally. Uh, and then the second thing, uh, the, the timing of the release of the census and the contents of the census uh, were all, in the end, controlled by the Democrats. And this will, this will make it easier for Democrats, and that's why the work that we're engaged in is even so much more important. So um, what do you need from people? Anything? No, just uh, I, we need them to encourage their state elected officials, their state assemblymen, their state delegates, their state representatives, their state senators, Get a backbone. Be tough. Don't give in. Don't just say, oh, goodness, this won't happen. This won't affect me. It affects every family all across America. Make sure that we're watching what's going on in this redistrict. If they see it coming off the rails in their state to raise the flag and we will come to provide the support they need to get fair maps so they can actually make sure their vote matters. Mike, can I ask you two questions to jobs you used to have? One, uh, I don't I don't know if I trust I don't know what to trust anymore. I don't trust our Justice Department. I don't trust our intelligence community anymore. Is it, Can you talk me off the ledge, or sh- uh, should I be on this ledge? So here's my, here's my best. And I, I, I'll speak for the organization I ran. I, I, I saw what happened to the FBI. It became deeply politicized. I also saw that there was risk that happening at the other intelligence organizations, including the one that I ran at CIA. I, my predecessor was a fellow named John Brennan. Mm-hmm. He, he brought real politics into how they did analysis of the data that was collected. My, my second observation is most of the folks who work at the CIA are good people. A lot of ex-military folks, a uh, significant piece of them. Uh, these are people who are trying to do their jobs, execute on behalf of America, make sure we have good info for our decision makers. But if the political leadership is corrupted, if the people who are appointed and the people who are confirmed decide to drive politics down into whether it's uh, the Justice Department or the FBI or any intelligence agency, this is where it comes unhinged. We we saw that at the FBI. We've seen it in the Department of Education Civil Rights Division. We've seen it. We, we want we want good people with sound values leading those. And it's why these elections ultimately matter, because the people presidents put around them drive into those systems and processes. And people ask me, because we were involved over in Afghanistan, people have asked me, Glenn, is the State Department, why would they intentionally thwart all of these things? And I answer the same way, that I believe there are good people in the State Department. In fact, I know there are, because there are some people that are helping, um, but they're at the lower levels. On the other, I, I can't give you an answer other than, you know, if it was incompetence, occasionally things would break in America's favor, and they don't seem to. <laughs> no, uh, this is policy. These are decisions that President Biden and his senior team made in Afghanistan. And I'll pause there for a second to say bless you for the work you're doing, helping folks get out, helping Americans get out, helping those who we made promise to get out. It is critical work. Don't give up. There's Thank you. A handful of groups doing it. I, I, I know you know this. There's a handful of other groups doing it, too. Yeah, we do. should all figure out how to work together. We are. Get folks out as quickly and as capably as that. So bless yeah. you and, and stay in that fight. Thank you. But you've, you've run into it. You've run to it at senior State Department levels where they just need a clearance to fly or they just need a single piece of paper well within yeah. a simple 
capacity of the State Department to deliver, and there is a down on from high decision not to do that. I can't explain it. I also can't articulate why they made the set of decisions they did around closing programs, pulling the military out before the civilians. These are unexplainable, and I think they they drive to a deeper misunderstanding of who we are as Americans. Mike, thank you very much. Um, We'd love to have you on again. We really, uh, I'm a big fan, and I really appreciate everything that you've done. God bless you. Thank you. Mike Pompeo, back in just a minute. Real quick, I just want to congratulate Mark Levin. Uh, He just, for his book, American Marxism, just uh, smashed the one million books sold. (laughs) That is impossible to do now. In today's book market, that does not occur. Yeah. Uh, That's amazing. That's amazing. Congratulations, Mark. You deserve it. Uh, This, I mean, he works so hard on his books. He does. And he's brilliant. And he's I really brilliant. didn't know there were still a million people who read books. <laughs> I wasn't. Or no. could read. Yeah. Uh, uh-uh. At all. Yeah. Which is, I, I had lower opinions of mm-hmm. this country, I guess, than I should. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's an amazing achievement. It Jeez. is. It is. I, I can't tell you the last time I saw a million books sold. Really hard to do. Really hard. Really hard Impossible. to do. Impossible. And one of the things, because there was a time, you go back decades, and you could sell a million books. A really successful book might do a million in, a, in the first week or the first month. Yeah. You have to really be consistent. People need to keep buying that book for week after week after week after oh, week. Oh, months. Yeah, uh, now. To do that. So that's really that's yeah. a great achievement. Yeah, yeah. I like Mike Pompeo, by the way. I, I, you know, he's one of those guys, there's varying levels of, of aides that worked through the, and, and cabinet level people who worked through the Trump administration. Some I really like, some, eh, you know, are not my favorites. Mike, is just, he's a really smart guy. He's on top of it. He's a serious person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can tell, I mean, whether you agree with him or not, He's a force to be reckoned with on 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 this stuff. Oh, I think he's really, I think he's really good. I hope we see him again. But there's there's certainly talk around him as a potential presidential candidate, particularly if if Donald Trump does not decide to run again. Uh, there's a lot of people kind of in that realm that I think are are closely enough tied to Trump that they wouldn't run against him. But why would you run? I mean, if Trump is going to run. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Do, would you sign up to be a part of the the gaggle going it's up? It's his if he wants it. Clearly, yeah. And well, his his own aides have said he's ninety eight percent or ninety nine percent going to run. His yeah, own, his he's own people. going to run. He's going to run. I think so. Yeah. At the very least, he's not going to say he's not going to run. Yeah. Um, I do not expect. Uh, Mike Pence to be the uh, VP if he does run again, and that's another possibility would... for Mike Pompeo. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, again, there's this is not Mike talking. Obviously, he was just on the show on something else. But th- your mind jumps, of course, because we we do overemphasize the importance of this back and forth politics part of it. But looking forward, I mean, how can you not with the way things are going right now? It's it's there's a there's an escapism element to look ahead at some other option other than Biden Harris. And, you know, this 2022 election is going to come pretty quickly. Hopefully uh, there's enough there to stop what the left is trying to do in a lot of ways. Do you but... know what the Republicans are for? Are you... <laughs> is that no, a philosophical that's a, question? No, that's a serious question. Mm-hmm. Do you know what they're for? If there's been, if there's ever been a time when they need to say, this is what we believe, and this is what we will stand for, and this is what we'll do, and hold us to it, it's now. Because I, I don't know what they stand for. I I, I, right now, it's essentially just it's Donald Trump's party, right? When it comes to a presidential level, it's, Don, it's Donald. No, no, Trump's no, no, party. no, 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 no. I mean for the for the, the midterms. Sen- oh, okay, for the Senate. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for the House and the Senate. Well, all, I think all they need to do, honestly, all they need to stand for is to. I'm not Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. That's that is essentially, and I know you always get into this, and you're correct, and that running uh, against something is not as good as running for something, and they yeah. will they will emphasize. Certainly, they will talk about the things that. Like, for example, the overreach of government through COVID. Uh, I think I think a huge part of this is going to be what the left did to keep kids out of school and all the effects that are going to echo through our society for a long time to come because of that decision. Oh, decades. Yeah. Decades. That's something they can definitely emphasize. And I think there are it's a popular position. Yeah. Now, this is why you mentioned before earlier today that they're trying to reverse this. The Democrats are trying to say they were the ones who wanted kids yeah. back in schools. In Virginia, that's actually what the Democrats are running on. That they're the ones <laughs> that wanted to open the schools. It was the Republicans that stood in the way. Unbelievable.
hasn't moved the interest rate yet. They. This is the Glenn Beck program. Glad you're here. Um, I saw that. Who was it? it? Wasn't Jack Dorsey? It was one of the one of the uh, content people uh, at uh, at Big Tech that said, "Oh, they're looking into letting Donald Trump back on. Uh, back on. Are we gonna let him on? Well, well, well we're thinking about. It. We're taking it under advisement. Yeah, uh, might have something to do with the president's uh, tech lawsuit. He is suing all of them." Catherine or Katie Sullivan, she's general counsel at America First Policy Institute, and uh, we wanted to get her on and talk about where this is headed. Hi, Katie. How are you? Hi. It's so great to be on the show. I'm a big fan. Thank, oh, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. That means a lot coming from you. I, I know you were in the, with the attorney general, uh, yes. Bill Barr, under the Trump administration. So tell me, tell me what um, is happening with this, this lawsuit. Sure. So we filed a complaint, um, the first complaint announced by the president as our lead plaintiff uh, included a cause of action for, uh, for, you know, for the First Amendment violation. We then amended the complaint to add uh, issues surrounding Section 230 and the potential unconstitutionality of that as applied, as well as two really interesting claims under Florida law, which is that in essence, these uh, big tech uh, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook are lying to their users. So we have all of those causes of action now pending. Wait, 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 wait. Of- How are yes. they lying to their users? Well, they tell um, your, the users, so say, you know, my mother, your mother, whomever is sitting at home, believing that they're on some kind of free, open Discord uh, platform where they're getting all kinds of unfiltered ideas. And yet they are most clearly and in a most biased way filtering the information that people are getting on their site. Uh-huh. Um, so that that is the biggest, uh, I would say, lie there is. What makes it even worse and contrary to Florida law is the fact that they the information that they choose to allow um, to be public is all in collusion with government officials. Yes. And it's what government officials and, and really the Democrats want. So that's the big lie, uh, Glenn, in, in our opinion. Well, I, I tell you, they, you're exactly right with that. You can see just by all the people that are going in and out of the Democratic White House, you know, every, every four years um, that are going to big tech. But, you know, the other thing is, is they destroy businesses and reputations they every time they mark any of my any of my tweets or any of my posts with uh you know possible false information or whatever and they have been wrong over and over and over again but every time they do that they create the impression that i am faulty uh, that i provide faulty information and i have no problem if it's true but most times it's not true Correct. And they're deciding. It's the 1984 um, Ministry of Truth from uh, George Orwell, 1984. It is truly the Ministry of Truth. This is what they are doing. They're deciding, they're gaslighting America and deciding what they will label as truth and not truth. When we know that there are two, I mean, this country, Glenn, is built on the idea that we have open discord and mm-hmm. different ideas and freedom of speech. And so you're right. And they took the sitting president of the United States and continually labeled his tweets and his other posts um, as misinformation. This is right before the 2020 election. What is the user at home supposed to be thinking? What kind of damage does that do uh, uh, to his presidential race? I mean, it is, it's exactly as you say, but it's not just him. It's everyday censored American. Over 94,000 have uh, provided their stories on takeonbigtech.com and told us, there's, I mean, they're heart-wrenching, these stories, and the people's lives that have been ruined. Ruined. Just yep. ruined. Just ruined. 
Uh, so they they filed, I think it was, what, two weeks ago, uh, a motion to transfer the venue, which would take it out of Florida and bring it to big tech California. Did mm-hmm. that go through or not? So it's really kind of interesting because we do have three judges. As each case is so factually specific, it's not really appropriate to consolidate um, for multiple reasons that okay. would probably bore your listeners. Uh, however, so right now we have motions to change a transfer venue filed in front of three different judges in all three cases. And our responses were filed in YouTube and Twitter last week. And so we sh- were expecting decisions there. And our Facebook response is due on Friday. We may have a chance to reply. So we'll see what the Florida judges have to say. I just don't. First of all, Jack Dorsey, hasn't he shut down all of his offices and everyone's working remotely? <laughs> and so I don't know how you can say that you have some forum in Northern California when, you know, you've decided to be completely remote. It's There's all kinds of reasons why their motion to change venue just doesn't work anymore. It uh-huh. is in their terms of service, and that's what they're going to rely on. Um, but we do have arguments against that. So um, how how real do you think this is? How afraid do you think they are? I mean, if if this if this strategy works, I mean, this is up there with the Abrahamic Accords as a legacy for Trump. Yeah, it's so, of course. Uh, you know, we are, the litigating attorneys in this case are brilliant. John Cole leading the pack, uh, just have a team of litigating attorneys who are incredible. I really believe in this case and all four causes of action. They haven't been very public. Of course, MSNBC and CNN dismissed it as ridiculous. But here's what's interesting. There, um, we had an intern from America First Policy Institute who took a business class, and on her very first day, they brought this case up as something that was being taught. She's actually over in Scotland. Mm. Uh, Twitter, a Twitter lawyer is giving an hour-long speech on a panel for continuing legal education and a great big, huge conference here in Virginia. If you represent the plaintiff in any lawsuit against big tech, you you weren't allowed to go to the conference. So there's little indications like that, uh, Glenn, that I think shows that they're a little more concerned about this than maybe CNN and MSNBC are reporting. Mm. And the ramifications, what happens if you win? Well, if we win, the first thing is, is our motion for preliminary injunction, since President Trump has such a unique set of circumstances and what we believe is a government exception, the president, uh, if the president is reinstated pursuant to our injunction, then that's a real sign that they're concerned. Um, And I think at that point, we start to look at, you know, what this class action can be. There's some other really interesting cases around the country. And I just want to take a second and remind everyone that Section 230 was designed to uh, uh, provide, you know, grow the Internet, have this be a burgeoning business. But they're supposed to be watching exploitation and, you know, for children and sex trafficking. And there are cases across this country, um, including one uh, which is uh, with a Sports Illustrated model, and it, which is very strong. And her copyright has been uh, completely infringed upon knowingly by Twitter and Pornhub. And they're not shutting that down at all. Twitter is the way that many people are trafficked on a regular basis. Twitter is? Yes. Oh, yes, sir. There's two separate cases pending currently, one in Texas and one in California, for people who were trafficked direct. And I've spoken to victims who were trafficked through Twitter. So I will just say that that, I think, is also an interesting angle for these companies that is not part of what we are doing, but is part of pressure that's being put upon them, which is you're not even doing what Section 230 allows you to do, which is to take down content to prevent sex trafficking and, and you know, ch- child exploitation. You're not accomplishing that. 
However, look what you're doing to the president of the United States and other good people like you, Glenn Beck. Hmm. Um, Katie, that's nice of you to say. May I ask a May I ask a question? Uh, because you you did work for um, uh, Attorney General William Barr, and I've really mm-hmm. lost my I've I've lost my trust of the Justice Department, and I was really go- I was rooting for uh, for for uh, Bill Barr. And and the Durham report and it it just never came out. Do you have any insight on that? What 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 happened? What was going on? The only insight that I do have is, and it's funny because I really love President Trump and respect him, and blew up my life and left the judgeship in order to come here to Washington D.C. and work for him. Mm. So I am very loyal to him. I also worked very very closely with Bill Barr. And, and love him very much as well. Um, one of the best parts about working for General Barr is that, you know, there weren't leaks. There was, yeah. you know, you stayed in your lane. Mm-hmm. And so anything, that, and even though I traveled with him quite frequently, we, you know, I speak to him occasionally now. I, I, I really, he's a fantastic guy. I don't have any insider knowledge <laughs> because he is someone who was, totally professional and buttoned up and you just didn't talk out of school and that's not how he ran the department well, good so, for him good yeah. for him good for him katie thank you so much and uh let us know how we can uh, how we can help are you still taking stories yes take on big any of your listeners who have been censored in any way please come tell us your story we'll reach out we're featuring videos of people um about three or four times a week Take on bigtech.com. It would be great if, if you guys can share. And, and our hearts go out to each and every one of you. It's all very personal to everyone, and, and we do care. So thank you, and thank you for everything you do, Glenn Beck. You bet. Thank you. Katie Sullivan, okay. uh, General Counsel, American First Policy Institute. Take on bigtech.com. Have you ever received a phone? 